So you're saying that there's a difference between being a child and being an heir. Yeah, so that he's biologically yours, but he's my heir. And once I adopt him, I can't unadopt him. So, everybody, welcome back to The Move. We're reviving with the book, 10 minutes at a time. Today's episode, we're looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. Have you read it? Can you dig it? Have you read it? it? I've read it. It was good. Good. Have you read it? If you haven't read it, please go read it. Check it out. We'll, we'll be wait here. For you. Just chilling. Right here. Subscribe, like, comment. <laughs> Do all the things. All right. Here welcome we back. Ten right. minutes starting now. Three, two, one. Let's go. So I've preached this sermon a handful of times, and I've made this point before where God does not have grandchildren. Yes. He only has children. Yes. Can you, can you can you can uh, you pursue what does that mean? Do you, do you understand my intention with that phrase? Absolutely. That he has direct relationship like a father does with a child with all of us. That he is not removed uh, by some sort of proxy, right? But we are all his children. Like Paul said, in him we live and breathe and have our being. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. So that that's great, but that's not what I meant by the thing. <laughs> Here's what I mean. Like you can get like okay, so you got a you got a dog and another dog. They have a baby. It's a dog, right? You have a, a bird and another bird. They have a baby and it's a bird. You mm. can't have a Christian and another Christian come together. They have a baby and it's a Christian. Mm. You know? Oh, you, I see you what, what you're doing there. You, yeah. you, you talk to people and you That's ask them. Good. So, like, oh, you you're also a believer. How long have you been a Christian? And they say things like, I've been a Christian my whole life. Yeah. And almost. I mean, I don't want to judge everybody, but I want to say we'll with high degrees of certainty, when I hear that phrase, I understand what they're meaning. And what they mean is that they have a cultural version of Christianity, that they might have been born into a family that is Christian, yeah. that they might have gone to church on the weekend. They yeah. might even pay their tithe and yeah. occasionally pray and study their Bible. Yeah. But most people that I meet that are spirit filled can yeah. tell the distinction between growing up in a Christian family and actually becoming a Christian. And what is the marked difference here between growing up? And well, I think you've explained it, but what is the marked difference between before when I wasn't a Christian and now that I am before yeah. I wasn't a child and now that I am? Yeah, what is that? To, to, to me, the difference is being born Again, there there is I, I like to think that there is a clear distinction between a before and an after. Yeah. Um that that it is true that when you accept Christ that there is a, a shift that takes place. Yeah. This this doesn't mean that you gave up lots of things, but there's this inward shift yeah. that takes place in the mind. And to me this is helps me to understand where it talks here in this chapter where it says for all those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. Okay. Now I'm with that and I'm really glad that you went there. But I feel as though there's been a slight overlooking of the first two verses of this passage okay. that actually make uh, certain claims about what identifies these sons of God. Okay, right? go for it. And maybe we can flesh that out a little bit. Well, I, I, I really want to problematize it and put it back to you Okay. of these first two verses that what, just to draw back on it, because this is an extension of what we talked about before, but what does it mean to no longer live in the flesh and live in the spirit in light of the second half of verse 13? Do you see the second half of verse 13? So let's check it out. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live? Right there. Yeah. Okay. So help me understand the problem or the pain point there. So how do we actually say and live dead to the things of the flesh and alive in the spirit? And I know that we've covered that to some degree, but in light of what you're saying, how would you distill it? Um, so perhaps this born again or becoming a son of God isn't just this being born again thing, but it also is this death thing first mm -hmm. and being resurrected into the spirit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, something that I have seen in my own life, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, mm -hmm. that means that there is a legitimate active rejection 
to all that which used to rule me because of my renewed mind and new standing as a son. And this is what I mean when I was when I was saying that it doesn't necessarily mean that you turned away from some radical lifestyle. Like that's not what conversion means uh-huh. necessarily. Cuz so to the person that was born in a good Christian family yeah. and never joined a gang and they never, you know, shot up the bank or they uh-huh. never there's I can't point to those things, yeah. but there is a, a shift inwardly that takes place. There is a death to this. I will live life for myself and the self-centeredness that I will live to the expense of someone else. Yeah. That's the shift that I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the, the experience of being dead there, being born again, mm-hmm. having that uh, experience of being adopted into mm-hmm, the family of mm-hmm. the Lord. And then there's this, this place for an active rejection of that. Correct. Where there's this ongoing cognitive awareness and maybe not the clearest cognitive awareness, but something that agrees with the spirit inside you that's actually teaching you and leading you and directing you in the way that a son or daughter, a child would live that is in direct contrast to your former mind and life. Yes. And what I love about this passage is that it reveals the the intimacy with God that we get to enjoy as a child of God. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. So so here we say that we get to cry out, Abba, Father. Now, yeah. this is something that you may have heard it in church before. This is a, an echoing of the prayer of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, up to this time, God is seen as this God off in the distance, separated by this law. The law might even be this ladder upon which we kind, yeah. kind of climb to work our way back to the Lord. And yet Jesus yes. shows up on the earth and he prays in the book of Mark. He says, Abba, Father. Yes. And this is surprising because uh, contextually or not uh, culturally, yes. Abba is like saying daddy. Yes. Like you're a child with some strong, intimate, and emotional ties to the father. This yes. was something that was abnormal to them at this point in time. And so how is it that someone who was rejecting God, who was an enemy of God, as other language that we see here, now gets to call them Abba, Father? Well, there's a little uh, framing that needs to have, a little context, a contextual background here, that this language of adoption that allows for the intimacy of Abba, Father, is really important in the Roman world. Mm-hmm. Precisely because, as I understand it, in Roman law, um, one, you can actually uh, disown a child, mm-hmm. right, for a, a whole host of reasons, right? Can a child do that? Can a child initiate that process? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't read the story I'm Roman thinking law. of is the um, prodigal son. Uh, you are dead to me. Kind yeah. of an experience. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's in um, that's in uh, Jewish life and thought, right? Uh-huh. I, I'm appealing actually to Roman. To Roman. Oh, yeah. Hence, because and, and it's because we're in the Book of Romans, right? Fair. And so, in the Roman life and thought, as opposed to Jewish life and thought, a son, a natural son, could actually. So, say you have a natural son, mm-hmm. and I have a political standing that I require to pass down my estate. You're a king. To, you're a ruler. You got land. I, yeah, I'm actually somebody who belongs to the Senate. I belong to a different class. You're a pleb. I might be a <laughs> patrician, right? And so, as a patrician, as somebody who belongs maybe to to the Senate class, I uh, it's my duty to pass down that which I have owned, and also uh, I think it's courses. Uh, homo, so I can't remember, but you're supposed to um, then have a legitimate heir that you go through the process of the uh, political growth and steps, right? Uh, you can become, uh, you go off to war, you can be a tribute, tribunate, you then maybe become a junior member of the Senate. You, It's, it's all these things, right? Uh-huh. And so say you have a child, but I don't have a child. I can actually adopt your child. So that right? my child becomes your heir. My heir. So you're saying that there's a difference between being a child and being an heir. Yeah, so that he's biologically yours, but he's my heir. And once I adopt him, I can't unadopt him, hmm. right? And so there is this place where he's moved from one context to another. You have to agree to it mm-hmm. in one in some sense, and there might be an exchange of money. But once I receive him, that child knows that they were desired, they were wanted, and they now serve as my heir and they receive all rights and privileges Ooh. that are mine politically and geographically. Mm-hmm. Right now, here's a really interesting thing is that you were still biologically related to your previous previous family. So, yeah. And you can actually not have to sever those biological ties. You can even perhaps bring them in into that other family. Yes, they can now experience to some degree the Perhaps benefits not the fullness have, of it. No, but they can 
share in some of the goodness that you now have, right? So, so connect the dots. I see you're, you're setting us up for something So the here. dots are that there are these two parties, mm-hmm. right? There is the, if I had to say it this way, there's a party of Adam 1, Adam 2. You could even look at it as there's the ruler of this earth yep. kind of a thing. Yep. But mm-hmm. there is a family, right? Mm-hmm. There's a human family and there's this divine family. God is the pat. Pater, pa, pater familias, right, in the, in the Roman idea, that he gives a high price in order to adopt us. And that high price he has given is Jesus as a redemption. That redemption language is Lutron language that we talked all the way all back the way at, at the beginning. First couple episodes. Shout out to Lutron. So <laughs> Lutron, right. which is redemption language, he now redeems those who are biologically related to Adam 1. Mm-hmm and adopts us into his family through Jesus Christ. And now we participate in everything that Jesus had and he were heirs, right? According to the promise that he initially gave. So it's this transition, right? But that does not mean that we sever all ties with our former family. Mm. In fact, we actually go back and try to include them in that which into God has family. included us. So this adoption language is powerful, powerful language. Yeah. (laughs) With the last second there, I'd like to point out the end result of that is that we are his children. We are his children. We get to have intimacy with the father and call him Abba. And and let me just point something out. I was extra. But it's a legal right. Yeah. It's legal, right? And because Jesus Christ has actually paid the price, the redemption, right? He is our redemption. That the, is the exchange cost. The legal demands, therefore, of the law are yeah. null and void because there's a legal shift that takes place during that adoption. Exactly. So that means you can't be unadopted unless you walk away. That's right. And you're not even unadopted when you walk away. You're, you're just, just walking rejecting away it. from the from what you've you could have had inherited. There's a, there's an inheritance yours. in the bank that you just choose not to withdraw from. And this is Paul's language, like in Ephesians, when he says says, I want them to receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they might see how great their inheritance is amongst the saints. What's crazy is that that's how an inheritance works, is that even if you don't withdraw on it, it's still it's there. It's still yours. And so when we choose not to engage with the Lord in this in this matter, there is, an, there is an inheritance for us. There is power. There is grace. There is love. There's all these things. We're just making a decision to not tap into yeah, that. Yeah, and you have to be convicted of the truth that regardless of the circumstances that life throws at you, you've been adopted. That's irrevocable. Yeah. And then this question, can salvation be lost? Eh, That's a bad question because it's not even the, it's like not the language of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Here, what is the language? You can walk away from it. Yeah. That much is clear. That much is clear. But what Jesus Christ accomplished and who he accomplished it for, that's finished. Yeah. That's done. There you go. You are adopted. It's good news. Come on. We'll see you guys in the next 10 or 10 plus, whatever it ends up being. Peace.